How does it feel? How does it feel to have the greatest dream of one's lifetime come true? Well, I can tell you that for me, that dream feels joyous, exhilarating, and terrifying all in one instant, particularly when that dream is magnified by the 358 square miles of a national park, a dream as big as a national park. A dream that encompasses the magnificent 14,255 foot Long's Peak. A glorious, magnificent place. If I seem a bit preoccupied today, I offer my apologies. I have been wrestling with the words that I will use to share with the world this September at the dedication of this glorious place. And of course, already, it appears on maps. People are drawing borders that are called Rocky Mountain National Park. And they are already calling me, Enos Mills, the father of Rocky Mountain National Park. For me, I am reflecting on a journey that began when I was a boy of 14 and came to the Colorado mountains. Already, as a young man, I came to know it as a magnificent place, a place that I would call a Rocky Mountain Wonderland. But really, it was an accident that brought into being this dream. A glorious, magnificent, life-changing accident. I was a young man of 19, the year was 1889, and I had just finished a mining job in Butte, Montana. With some time on my hands, I decided to explore more of this United States. I found myself on the West Coast, walking the streets in San Francisco. It was there that I saw a crowd of people gathered around a man, listening to a speech. What was this man talking about that held this crowd so rapt? Was he talking about politics, religion, great ways to make lots of money? No, he was talking about plants the taxonomy and characteristics of small plants. Now, this was of interest to me, of course, but to this large crowd of people, well, I was intrigued. And so, as the crowd dispersed, I made my way up to the man and introduced myself. Hello, my name is Enos Mills. A pleasure to meet you, he said. My name is John Muir. John Muir perhaps the greatest naturalist of our time, John Muir, the founder of the Sierra Club. John Muir, and in those minutes that followed, he and I set off on a path, walking back blocks to the trolley station, and in that short instant, he filled my head with a lifetime of dreams and ideas and taught me to dream a dream as big as a national park. Well, I would return to my day-to-day -day life. I would soon find myself the proprietor of the Long's Peak House. And it was shortly thereafter that another accident occurred. The state of Colorado was looking for a Colorado snow observer, and they couldn't seem to find anyone to take the job. <laughs> Not only did I take the job, I loved it. I thrived in it. You see, it was my job every spring to go and measure the snowpack up and down the Continental Divide for agricultural interests especially, so they would know the amount of water that they could be expected to receive in the rivers and streams. But in doing so, it took me up and down to places that I would never see otherwise, magnificent vistas, not only seeing plants, but some of our most majestic wildlife, including the grizzly bear. The grizzly bear is an animal that I have called our greatest wild animal. And I would also call the grizzly bear our most misunderstood wild animal, perhaps our most maligned 
wild animal on the North American continent. Oh, it is an honor to be here today, but I would so much rather that we could have brought a grizzly bear before all of you today and have that grizzly bear recount his or her autobiography. A 40-year-old grizzly bear. Now, this grizzly bear might tell you about its ancestry that could be traced back to Asia. The grizzly bear would tell you about exciting adventures as a cub with its mother. This grizzly bear would tell all of you about amazing encounters with animals and perhaps encounters with that most curious of animal, the human being. Now, today, there are many who are advocating for the complete extermination of the grizzly bear on the North American continent. I do not subscribe to this idea. I have wished that there could be a place where the grizzly bear was safe from poison, safe from traps, safe from dogs, safe from guns. And as I wrestled with this and with how there could be a place that would preserve our wild plants and animals, I did not have to look far for a model. I thought of Yellowstone National Park, this wonderful place where the plants and the animals have their specific place in preservation. And so it began a six-year journey, a six-year battle, a six-year crusade of talking to whomever I could, imploring them that there should be a national park in the northern mountains of Colorado. And I would write letters, I would send telegrams, I would speak to whomever I could, to Congress people, whomever would listen, lectures, crisscrossing the country. It was a long six-year journey. It would take me to the American cities. Now, it would be interesting in the American cities. I would encounter people who would ask me, Mr. Mills, I have read your writing. You have spoken of being in the midst of an avalanche, of walking for days with snow blindness. You have written about being in the midst of a wildfire, hearing that crackling sound at intense heat. You have seen dangerous animals up close. Were you not afraid? I would smile at the question, knowing in my own heart that I was much more fearful in the American cities than in any of those experiences. I once wrote there were four things in the cities that I feared. Fires, automobiles, streetcars, and last but not least, banquets. Oh yes, you must be very careful at banquets not to overindulge. That is why I am perfectly happy most days carrying around a pocket full of raisins. They are all the sustenance I need. And I would need that nutritional fortitude on this six-year journey. The opposition weighed in immediately. The opposition to a national park idea, the grazing interests weighed in, opposed. The timber interests, opposed. The mining interests, opposed. The hunting interests, opposed. And yet, we won the debate with an idea that I believe every day more and more are taking to heart. This idea that in preserving nature, we are ensuring the long-term economic viability of our country by ensuring the preservation of the wild plants and the animals. Ah, it would be a long journey those six years. And I remember some dark days, many dark days. Most of them, it seemed that this dream would never, ever become a reality. Along the way, one day I received a letter it read, Mr. Mills, you make me feel good when I look your way. You are making good on a noble career. It was my friend of 25 years, John Muir. John Muir died last year on Christmas Eve, one day after the bill to introduce Rocky Mountain National Park was brought into 
legislative consideration by the House of Representatives Committee on Public Lands. Mr. Muir is gone now, but his legacy only continues to grow. And I think of that when I think about the next generation and the generation after that, the children, like my own beautiful daughter, Enda, and how a dream that was inspired by John Muir will span generations. I'm thinking of a day recently when some children were out playing. I would hear their cries and laughter, and then it seemed a bit silent, and I realized the children had returned to the Long's Peak House and wanted to seek me out. They said, Mr. Mills, we have found in the woods a beaver colony, and we're very curious. We want to understand these animals. Can you tell us about them? <laughs> well, I thought I could give a lecture about these animals, but let's go. And so with the children, I asked them to lead me to where they had found the beaver colony. And we walked through the brush, through a pathway, to a stream, and made our way to a small island. And there we built a makeshift raft. And we got aboard that raft in the water, and we acted out what we saw the beaver doing. We became these very animals that we were curious about, which we were studying. Nature as a classroom, a dream as big as a national park that will span generations. As I think about the children, I often wonder what it would be like if somehow we could gather together all of the children of the world in one place, and not only the children of our time, but the children of generations past, all the children that ever were, and there was a time that we would tell them of all of the great stories of civilization. We would tell those children about the magnificent art and the architecture, the great physical creations of our species. We would tell them of, of skyscrapers and ships that were built, of railroads, and those children would marvel at these stories. We would tell them of the great governments that were formed, the currencies, the economies, the democracies, the leaders, the trade that would extend across continents, across oceans. And when those children heard those stories, their eyes would come alight and marvel. But I submit to you that when we tell those children that there was a time and a place when good, sensible people came together in the preservation of nature to preserve the great wilderness treasures of humanity, I submit to you that those stories would set those children's hearts alight like no others, that there was a time and place when people saw the need to preserve and they acted. And places like Rocky Mountain National Park would be preserved for generations. This September, Rocky Mountain National Park will be formally dedicated into existence. And yet, I don't think in our lifetime we will have the span to appreciate what was done in our lifetime. Perhaps we need 25 years, perhaps 50, perhaps in 100 years we might have the span of time to realize what it was to dream a dream as big as a national park. Lastly, I have often been asked to impart an idea for those who are about to enter the wilderness, and I've often wished that there would be some suggestive sign or expressive quotation that might linger agreeably in the minds of all. I have often imagined that we all might, in our mind's eye, see the bended limbs above the arched and leafy entrances to the woods ever shaping themselves into these words, health and hope to all who enter. And that once within this magnificent place, we would hear the treetops whispering, 
These are your fountains. These are your gardens of life. Kindly assist in keeping them. Thank you.